What personality type are you? What motivates your behavior? Discover the answers to these fascinating questions on Types, Your Personality Revealed. Hosted by personality experts Catherine and David Favre. Welcome to Types, Your Personality Revealed. My name is David. My co-host Catherine and I are experts in personality typing. We're both fascinated by researching what motivates human behavior. Did you know that in just the last few decades, a new personality typing system has been developed that is so powerful and revealing that it transcends all other systems? This system has been scientifically validated and is in alignment with the latest research on the brain. It reveals what your personality type needs to reach your potential in your relationships, career, and spiritual life. What if I told you this system was already being used by Fortune 500 companies, psychologists, coaches, and self-help seekers all over the world? This personality typing system is known as the Enneagram. As we know it today, the Enneagram is a powerful and sophisticated tool for self-discovery. This series will help you to determine your Enneagram type, identify your talents, and reach your potential. Many who use this system are able to quickly improve their relationships and transform their behavior in every area of their lives. We now know that temperament is inherited and that each one of us has a personality type from birth. This personality type behaves much like the operating system of a computer. For example, have you ever wondered why people see things so differently from you and why they pay attention to different details? The Enneagram helps to explain these differences by identifying nine distinct personality types. These Enneagram types have very different views of reality, all of which are inherently valid. Because we are born with our Enneagram type, it is our nature to see things the way that we do. By discovering our own personal Enneagram type, we can develop critical self-awareness, expand our view of the world, and increase our understanding of others. Before we begin exploring this fascinating system, I'd like to give you a little background on the two of us. Catherine and I love personality systems, and we've been working with the Enneagram personality typing system for over 24 years. I have a master's in psychology and am a certified Enneagram teacher. Catherine is a certified Enneagram teacher in three different Enneagram schools. Professionally, we're coaches, researchers, authors, and trainers. Additionally, we do organizational development and have developed online personality testing instruments that have been used by tens of thousands of people all over the world. You can find our free personality tests on our website at Enneagram.net. Next, we're going to show you the fundamentals of how to use this system. So here we have this, the very beginnings of the Enneagram. This is the basic symbol that we use um, whenever we're using the system, the numbers around the circle are actually shorthand for the different personality types, which we're going to go into here in a few minutes. But for right now, just know that when people use the Enneagram, they'll often say something like, oh, I'm a type 4, which happens to be my type. And they're referring to one of the numbers here on this symbol. The term Enneagram is actually a Greek term and actually means nine-pointed graph. Ennea means nine, and graph means uh, drawing. So what we find with this symbol that makes it so unique in terms of the use in a personality typing system is that it actually is used to predict movement of any type of system. So here we're using this ancient symbol, which actually goes back to the time of Pythagoras, to help us understand the way that human behavior changes over time. We all know that we all change almost daily, and depending on whether we are stressed or we're in a comfortable situation, we may act very differently. The lines on the symbol are actually used to help you see the different personality traits that you would have besides just your dominant Enneagram type. So it's actually quite simple. So for example, I'm a type four. I can pick up the traits of an Enneagram type two or an Enneagram type one. And Catherine is a type eight, yeah. and she can pick up the traits of an Enneagram type two or an Enneagram type five. Um, another key piece is that the types along the lines 
can be very instructive in giving you sort of like a guidepost or uh, on terms of where to focus if you're stuck in your own defenses of your own type. And that's something we'll definitely go into later in the series. There's another important uh, beginning understanding with the Enneagram symbol, which is a term that's called wings. And it's actually a very simple concept, which is that for all of us, our personality type falls somewhere on this circle. And for example, if you're a type nine, you may fall just to the right of type nine or just to the left of type nine. And if you fall more closely to Enneagram type one, we would say that you're a nine with a one wing. If you happen to have more of the flavoring of a type eight, we would say that you're a nine with an eight wing. Uh, a great example of a nine with a one wing would actually be President Obama. We see that he has this moral perfectionistic quality to him, and that's what's indicative of type one, as we'll learn later. So we see him more as a nine with a one wing, whereas uh, someone like uh, Steve Jobs, the CEO of Apple, would actually, we see him as a seven with an eight wing, um, yeah. And so that makes him a little bit more of a, a leader as than maybe a typical seven might be. Um, so Very dynamic type that is visionary, but a strength in that vision, directed, ex purposeful. Exactly. So the symbol is actually very easy to use, but the key here is that it allows us to give a much more sophisticated understanding of human personality, particularly that things can change. So, Catherine, could you tell us what these different color areas are all about? Yes, I, I also want to add that all the types are equal. No one type is better than any other. And that's why they're on a circle. And the interactive dynamic aspect of the Enneagram gives a lot of understanding as to why some people focus their attention so differently than others. So if you look at the green types at the top of this symbol, there are the word gut and acting. Well, eights, nines, and ones are very focused on what they do and how they move in the world and how they react. And they tend to be a little resistant. But they're people that are visceral, instinctual. They come from their uh, sensei understanding of the world. Whereas if we look at the pink types, they're heart types. It's about feeling. It's about understanding the world through the lens of the heart. Like, what is your heart telling you? What are you feeling about what's going on in any given situation? And they're trying to create relationship with others and understand interpersonal dynamics. Whereas if we look at the head types, the blue section, they're focused on thinking, assessing, looking at everything through the lens of, a, of measuring and weights, and how can you know truth? What do you need to know or understand? So we can look at this a little more deeply in the next slide. In this slide, we see what the types want and need. So the gut types at the top need acceptance. Take me as I am. Don't make me change. I want to be who I am and have you accept me. The corresponding fears are being overlooked. Do I matter? How can I know that I matter? There's also a fear of neglect and not being considered. Now, all types want to be considered. But in the case of the gut types, there's a tendency to feel that you really don't matter. And you want to know that people are cons going to take the time to consider what's import excuse me, important to you. Whereas the heart types need affirmation. What is affirmation? It's good job and some sort of appreciation for what you're doing and the efforts to make things happen. The corresponding fear is of being ignored. What is being ignored? It's when you make the effort to do something for others and you're not given credit for doing so. You're invalidated. So the heart types very much want to be validated for what they do. If you look at the head types, the need is for reassurance. Now what's the difference between reassurance and affirmation? Well, the key way to remember this is that reassurance is saying it'll be okay or here's the information you need to make a decision. Remember these types are head types so they're weighing and measuring their assessments. So reassurance could be a kind word that says it'll be okay 
or going online and finding out what experts have to say about any given subject that you may be concerned about so that you know. The corresponding fear is of being in chaos, of not knowing, of being ignorant, and not knowing what to expect. Now, I'm an eight. I'm a gut type. So it's really important to me to be accepted. And I really want to know where I stand with you and that what I'm getting is the truth. David, you're a four. What do you need to know? Well, as a type four, I'm over in the heart center. And that makes me often unusually emotional for a man. So twos, mm -hmm. threes, and fours are all focused on their image, their emotions, and relationships. So as a four, um, I particularly appreciate you know, affirmation. I'm focused on my image and really focused on my relationships. And mm -hmm. you know, that reminds me of something that the recent brain research actually has found, that we have brain cells not just in our head, but also in our gut and in our heart. Yes. And that fascinates me because here we have three different types of people. One comes from their head, one from their gut, and one from their heart. And we may find at some point that heart types actually have more brain cells in their heart and gut types have more brain cells in their gut. And we're looking at this as three types of intelligence. The gut types have instinctual intelligence, the heart types have emotional intelligence, and the head types have intellectual intelligence. Good point. I look forward to this research unfolding further. Exactly. And, you know, traditionally, uh, head type intelligence has been stressed, particularly in academics, but yes. there's lots mm -hmm. of books out now that talk about uh, sensate intelligence or emotional intelligence as being really critical. And here mm -hmm. with the Enneagram system, we can make a very complicated system very simple simply by looking at the fact that there really are just three types um, that are each trying to solve the same problem in three different ways. Mm -hmm. um, if you're new to the system, you can simply look at this as you've got gut people, head people, and heart people. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is that simple. So next, what we'd like to do is to actually show you some video examples of the different Enneagram types. Um, so here we have a slide that talks about the different names for the Enneagram types along mm -hmm. with the numbers. And what we're going to do first is we're going to tell you about Enneagram type 1, which is known as the moral perfectionist. And this type, their primary focus in life is wanting to be accurate, honest, fair, and objective. So, Catherine, can you tell us a little bit about what would really motivate someone wanting to behave that way? Well, the one more than anything wants to be respectable, to do what is right, to be appropriate. They feel that anything worth doing is worth doing right. So they're very diligent and they pay attention to details. This is a really um, focused type that wants to do what they should. Yeah, so this is a type that often makes a really good mentor or teacher. Because Absolutely. They're so, yes. proce they're so mm -hmm. focused on process yes. or, or the standards that they can really teach that to other people. Um, what would this type struggle with potentially? Well, their standards are internalized and they're very high. So they struggle with trying to get it right. And if they don't, or if others aren't doing what they believe is right, they can get frustrated and can get a little nitpicky or irritable and resentful. At their best, though, they're very ethical. This is someone that can really offer sage advice to the world and to others, which is why, as you mentioned, they make great mentors, teachers, counselors. So I was trying to think of some real life examples of this type and yeah. uh, I think we have like Hillary Clinton and Al Gore and what we mm -hmm. see with both of them is that they present themselves as holding their own authority very well but also as wanting to be very moral people. They have a mission, they have a purpose. These are a very purposeful type that is focused on what they should do. Uh, and old time movies had a lot of roles focused on this and Gregory Peck was a perfect example of playing many roles where he was morally dealing with some sort of dilemma and he always ended up having to do what was right. Well, why don't we take a look at a video of an Enneagram Type 1. My name is Joanne Finitzo. I live in Fremont, California. I'm a 1 and I'm self-proud, self-preserving. Reliable, dependable, orderly, capable, honest. I think being fair, seeing things from a 360-degree perspective, 
that I have all the facts to make decisions. The need to be right. The need to, uh, to not make mistakes. Well, because everybody makes mistakes, there's no, there is no perfection. And uh, so it's an unrealistic expectation. So I may think of myself as tough. It really always comes back to, no, it has to be right, it has to be true, it has to be honest, it has to be fair. Uh, are we following the rules? Do we cross at the lights? Do we pick up our litter? We just really have this uh, underlying constant motivation that things have to be right. It reduces the stress and anxiety and, uh, and makes, makes me less judgmental. I always hear that people find us very prickly and, um, and I'm hoping that I have reached a point where maybe I'm less so. So, uh, what did you notice about that clip, Catherine, that was particularly indicative of Enneagram Type 1? Well, it's not just the words that are used. Lexicon is very important and indicative of type. But it's the posture. Like, I have to remember to sit up straight. And ones always sit up straight. They're si they have a strong jaw, and they're appropriate. And they tend to zero in on things like an eagle eye. And they pay attention to what is just and fair. Yeah, I definitely noticed how many times that Joanne used the word right. Yeah. You know, that things have yes. to be right. Yeah. And we all want things right, but it isn't our constant focus. But with the type 1, it really is. And we edited it way down. There were many more rights. In so let's, interview. let's look at type 2. Uh, type 2 is the supportive advisor. Now, the 2 has a fear of being worthless, very different than the 1. And they want to be appealing, giving, caring, and heartfelt. What more would you say about this need to be caring and giving, David? Well, what's fascinating with type two is that, in a way, they figured out a fundamental truth, yeah. which is that in order to receive, it's better to give first. Mm -hmm. The difference with the two is, is that they kind of make a career out of this. Yes. So it becomes their whole identity, that I am the person who has abundance and I can give to you. So the high side of that is they're very focused on uh, what people need, but they're also very good at intuiting it as well. Yeah, they're really altruistic. But what happens if they're not getting their own needs met back? If they're giving and giving and giving and not receiving? Well, the two can uh, feel resentment. They can feel um, uh, maybe that they're not being loved. And the, the fear underneath all this for the two is that maybe that they think they fear that they're worthless. Now, of course, they aren't. Yeah. But that's what's driving this, yeah. this desire to uh, really give. Um, and the two sometimes can kind of have a do bill where they can give uh, maybe something that wasn't asked for and then have an expectation that they be given something back. But ultimately, it's coming out of that fundamental desire to really uh, to be of service. Would mm -hmm. you say that differently? Yes, they want to be valued. They want to be appreciated. And so if they give, they want people to acknowledge it. And they're exceptionally altruistic individuals that tend to be helpful more than any other Enneagram type to initiate help. Let's look at some examples, too. Uh, current pop uh, figures are Jennifer Lopez, John Travolta, Bill Cosby, Paula Abdul. We saw that a lot on American Idol. She got very emotionally involved and was the heart of American Idol. She Absolutely. was the one measuring what people felt. Yeah, the two definitely has that heart archetype. Um, and sometimes we can even actually even see that in the shape of their face. Yes. It's, it's quite amazing. So um, well, how about we take a look at a video of an Enneagram so Type 2? Type 2. My name is Peggy Costello. I live in Palo Alto, California. I am an Enneagram Type 2 and a social instinct. I'm nurturing, uh, gracious, helpful, supportive, um, and I can sometimes be frenetic. The two, um, always being helpful, um, loving to gather, uh, loving gathering people together, um, um, going out on a limb, um, meeting others' needs. <laughs> My greatest strength is being able to intuit the needs um, of others and um, understand and know what they're feeling. Um, I think when people are with me, they feel felt and. Um, nurturing people and being supportive of, of people and being the wind under their wings. I find that I really need uh, positive feedback, positive mirroring from other people. 
And if I don't get that, somehow I feel um, like I'm a failure. Not being able to express my needs directly to people sometimes comes out um, in ways that's uh, complaining or um, I can have resentment toward people for them not knowing what I need or not being appreciative of what I've done for them. What motivates me is making deep emotional connection with others. So the two is the mother archetype, you know, yeah. it really is. And the so nurturer. I yeah. hear it was just amazing to me. Peggy's talking about wanting to meet people's needs, that she can intuit the needs and feelings of others. Was there anything else that you noticed that seemed two-ish to you? Yeah, another hallmark of two is they almost feel their heart. And they have heart-shaped features and apple cheeks. And they're really inclined to be thinking about what others need. And you can even see it in the expression on her face. There's a gentleness, very soft eyes, very different than we looked at our one, who was more piercing, more focused. Right, I mean, here we're going from the type one, which really is the father archetype, whether, mm -hmm. whether the person is mm -hmm. a male or female, into the type two, which is kind of the mother archetype, again, mm -hmm. whether it's a male or female. So mm -hmm. with the type two, we get a much softer, a much gentler person who's very focused on relationships, mm -hmm. whereas with the one, we have someone that, you know, looks like they should be in a World War II movie in command. There's, a, mm -hmm. there's that gut type sense of solidity. With a little bit of shyness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So next, let's take a look at uh, Enneagram type three, which is known as a successful achiever. Um, this type wants to be competent, efficient, accomplished, and dynamic. And the thing I always notice most with this type is that they're so good at putting on the image that other people are expecting. So how do they do that, or, or why is that a motivation for them? Well, they're very adaptable people. They read cir circumstances, situations. They know what you want, and they try to deliver it. And they set their own goals. They're very self-motivated as well. More importantly, the three wants to be really good at what they do and look good doing it. So they want to know where that bar is, what you expect so that they can meet it and surpass it, so that you'll reward them. What fascinates me with type three is, whereas with type two, this is someone who's very focused on knowing themselves through relationship. With three, it's in a way knowing yourself through achievement and success, right. but in knowing yourself really how other people see you as successful. Mm -hmm. So it's really wanting to be successful in other people's eyes. Um, yes. This type is the, one of the most idealized types in American culture. And a lot of other countries actually see the U.S. as being very three-ish, mm -hmm. which is interesting, which is uh, in the U.S. we really value independence and self-confidence and even self-promotion. Mm -hmm. um, and those are all the hallmarks of, of type three. Um, where does this type struggle? This type struggles with being a little vain, with needing attention so much that they try to weave it into conversations or can be a little boastful or give little clues as to what they've done well. Now, ironically, they don't feel it as easily as other people when they're complimented. So they need more compliments mm -hmm. than the one does. Uh, twos, threes, and fours all need to be complimented, but threes in particular, because then they know they've done a job well and that they're admired. Whereas the two wants to be appreciated, the three wants to be admired. So uh, before we look at the video of an Enneagram Type 3, a few famous examples would be Oprah Winfrey, mm -hmm. um, Tom Cruise, and Michael Jordan. And with all three yeah. of them, you certainly see the incredible levels of success, uh, the high work ethic, and the self-confidence that they, they project. So let's take a look at a Type 3. I'm Dave Roos. I live in Los Altos. I'm a 3, the performer type. I'm, I'm a self-prez, for sure. I like to think of myself as very efficient. With the three, it's a funny thing that the three doesn't have to do it perfectly like the one. The three just wants to get it done. And, and we're very good at doing that. My, one of my biggest challenges, the way I knew I was a three, was when I heard the three described as a person who wasn't able to take a vacation. And on vacations, it can be very, very, very difficult because there's nothing to do. And so the challenge is, if there's nothing to do, then I feel absolutely lost. Once I wanted to run under a six-minute mile, and I ran under a six-minute mile, and I didn't, I stopped running for a period of time because there was nothing else to do. Goal orientation is all that there is. I mean, of course that's not true, but that was my thinking. I know that people have often said that 
uh, that if it's inscribed on your tombstone, he, he, he was always at his office. Is that really what you want? And for three, that is actually really what they want. But there are other things in life besides just getting the job done. Self-confidence can get you into huge trouble. And it's lovely to feel that you can do something and then go ahead and do it. But it's really horrible when you say you can do something and you go out and make a disaster out of it. I think the high side of being a three is, is loving to have these challenges. So it fascinates me here that this type says that he has trouble taking a vacation. Yes. Why is that? Because you're not accomplishing something mm -hmm. unless you make the vacation structured in a way where you're going places, doing things, and then you've met some sort of goal. It's a very goal-oriented type. So they're focused on what they can do that will achieve an end that they can measure. And vacations aren't always easy to do that, whereas other types want to relax. This type struggles with it. So this is a type that's so focused on efficiency, they might even cut corners to get something done? Absolutely. They want to be comfortable with themselves by being busy. Rather than relaxing and kicking back, they want to do. This is the can-do type. Now let's look at the type four. The four, in contrast, is the romantic individualist. This type has a fear of being inadequate and wants to be inspired, intuitive, original, and unique. More than any other type, this individual wants to be their own person, a one of a kind. When you experience that as a four yourself, what does it mean to want to be a one of a kind and to stand out and be singular? Well, as a type four and having used the Enneagram for a long time, uh, there's an odd internal feeling where you are afraid that if you don't have something special to bring to the table, you might not be noticed at all. Um, so it's really important to try to be special or different or have an accomplishment or something so that you think that people will like you. So you manage your fear of being ignored as a heart type by doing something that other people will find as individualistic or specific in a certain way. D does it have a sense of aesthetics? Is that important? Beauty? Are these qualities that are important to you as Absolutely. A I mean, focusing on aesthetics and beauty is really important uh, to all fours. Uh, there's a sense of wholeness and beauty that is very rich for fours. Um, it really makes them feel good about themselves to have beautiful things around. So next, why don't we take a look at a video of an Enneagram Type 4. My name is Tara. I live in Fremont. I'm a sexual four. Creative, passionate. Um, I'm a bit of a snob as far as art and design. More counterculture, not mainstream stream culture. I, uh, I really like approval. That's a big motivator for me. And also uh, to create something unique. I think that there's an ability in the four to transform uh, something ordinary into something extraordinary. That that passion and intensity can actually uh, transform. But certainly in my younger years, I would always uh, think I saw someone and I would say, oh, they look like they have a perfect life. I want that and I don't have that. So uh, that I either love or I hate. And it's that intense. It's the facial expressions, the body, that everything goes into that expression. My work as a four is uh, allowing the mind to moderate um, as well as the emotions, because I think the emotions are very good uh, guideposts and indicators and not to be ignored. However, um, it would be nice to have more of a blended experience. It's a very intense ride. And this is a very dramatic type, a very expressive type. Do those emotionals feel that intense? Oh, they do. You know, as an Enneagram Type 4, I've really had to learn that other people just don't feel it, the emotions as intensely as I do. And I notice that there are uh, roles that are kind of geared towards character actors, or some of the leads, Angelina Jolie or Johnny Depp, often play roles that involve this kind of intensity or, 
or intense plumbing of the internal world. Is there anything more you can say about what that need is to go deep? And well, there's a sense as a four that if things aren't emotional and deep, they're not authentic. And when things feel authentic, there's a wonderful sense of wholeness and everything coming together yeah. and or of deepness and richness in life or of life really having meaning. I mean, four is all about wanting to have meaning. Mm -hmm. So um, we certainly see this with, you know, like Jolie or Depp uh, in their intense performances and their eyes the, that make us really feel things. Um, mm -hmm. So next, we'd like to take a look at Enneagram Type 5, mm -hmm. which we call the investigative thinker. This type... Uh, We've moved now from emotional heart-based types over into the head center. This is the first of the head center types. And this type is focused on wanting to be knowledgeable, concise, and perceptive. And more than anything else, this type wants to make sure that they know things very deeply. So, Catherine, why is that uh, important to a type 5, to have real depth of knowledge? Well, it's interesting. It's like the 4. The 4 wants to have that deep emotional connection and feeling, but the 5 wants that in terms of information and knowledge. It's a means for managing the world. They use their brain power, so to speak, to manage difficulties, to assess problems, to work out solutions based on their intelligence. Now, any type can be intelligent, but the 5 uses it as a strategy. Now, whereas with the 4, we see a type that really is, uh, can even be dependent in a relationship, whereas with the five, we see a type that really doesn't even want the entanglements of obligation. No, they want to be self-sufficient. They want to have their own things and not be obliged to anyone. In fact, they have a, a fear of being invaded, of being engulfed, of being um, so involved that they can't listen to their own mind, their own thoughts. So with this type, what are they like socially? Or they tend to be somewhat shy. They stand back and observe. They want to really examine any given situation before they step into it. We've moved from the heart center to the head center. So it's about assessment. So they want to make sure they know what they're dealing with before they engage. So just uh, examples of this type would be Bill Gates, uh, Microsoft, or even Mark Zuckerberg. So we certainly yeah. see some of the real computer leaders as type fives. So let's take a look at a video of an Enneagram type five. Uh, my name is Danny Stern, and I'm a type five, and I'm a one-to-one. -one. Resourceful, skeptical, analytical, um, I'd also beyond the adjective, say a, a puzzle solver. Uh, being able to not only see the whole picture, um, but also being able to understand how things work how we got here, uh, what the components are, and what the dynamics of all those components are, uh, being able to break apart a situation and understand us, what gets us to where we want to go. Uh, I'm usually the one that's a little bit more plotting than reactive. When it, I, I think my greatest strengths uh, have always been being able to analyze a situation, uh, both being able to get the big picture of something as well as understanding all the small dynamics that make it uh, what it is, uh, the motivations of people involved, um, how things are going to come together, uh, the mechanics of it. I think fives are, are constantly analyzing what's in front of them, and they're constantly making forward predictions based upon that. I think there are kind of two voices within at least me as a five. Uh, there is a dispassionate uh, side, uh, seeing things as being, again, m more mechanical. I think the greatest weakness has been getting out of my own head uh, as I live in it a lot. There is more randomness okay. uh, in the world than um, I think a five or I'm, I'm totally comfortable with. It, it's hard sometimes to see when everything certain, has a certain logical course that that even though it's perfectly logical isn't necessarily going to be the outcome. It, it's a desire to be, to be expert in something. No, there's a, there, there's a constant desire to get rid of clutter, uh, to look at things in, in, in very simple terms. So it's fascinating to me to hear yeah. uh, Danny use terms like logic and uh, oh. sometimes thinking that maybe he needs to stay out of his head. Or, um, so yeah. can you tell us more what you saw in terms of this being a head type? Well, you could almost see him thinking the, the gears moving. There's a... 
less movement of the body and more going on in the head region. Whereas the one we saw, the upright, and with the two we saw the heart, and with the three we saw the focus on what was going to achieve and accomplish, and the four with their depth and their feelings. With the five, it's all about the head. It's, it's not in the body. And this type is really focused on everything going on inside their thoughts and ideas. And he gave a great example of that. And you can see how he's really focused on what he needs to do to have a clear mind. OK, Enneagram type 6 is also in the head center. This is the loyal guardian, we sometimes called the loyal skeptic. But this type is kind of interesting because there are two expressions of it. But overall, the six wants to fit in, be safe, secure, and know what to expect. They want predictability. And the fear is of uncertainty and being blamed. What do you feel it's like to be a six if you have a fear of being blamed? Well, I, my understanding with the six is they want to make sure that their security comes through belonging to a group. That group can be a family or a group of friends. So obviously, if you get in trouble, uh, you might not be in the group anymore. So if that's how you feel secure in life, it's really important to make sure that you have um, loyalty and, and that you're dutiful to the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the most dutiful type on the Enneagram, isn't it? There's a lot of anxiety, though. But there's both a phobic and counterphobic expression of six. Can you tell us about the difference between the two? Sure. There's a fascinating issue with sixes is, is that they're very unpredictable. And uh, the phobic six will tend to move away from something that they fear, whereas the counterphobic six will actually go towards what they fear. So if they feel afraid of something, they may actually sort of go into the fear and, and, and go ahead and approach it. Um, a couple of famous sixes. Uh, John Stewart, The Daily Show, uh, Julia Roberts, and yeah. uh, David Letterman. The boy or a, girl next door. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it's a, it's a type that is kind of confusing because of, the, of these different expressions. But let's look at the tape. Hi, well, I'm David. I'm right here from Palo Alto. My type is type 6 on the Enneagram, the loyal skeptic, and my lead instinct is type is the one to one, you know, about relationship. I'm warm and friendly to people. I feel like if I can be warm and friendly to people, they'll be warm and friendly back. It increases my likelihood that they can be trusted. And then the second thing is uh, I can be really counted upon. I'm pretty loyal. And then I'm a good problem solver. I can see what can go wrong and be pretty analytical about things. And then I believe I can be thoughtful. On the negative side is I can get overly doubtful of people and mistrust them because I can always see something you can't count on. I'm good at seeing underdog causes, what can go wrong in the world, and trying to, because you can see, you can doubt, you know, where things are going. And so that, I think that's my greatest strength, taking on challenges and making things work out. Well, I think there's two kinds of things six, uh, sixes do. One is this more sort of counterphobic where you take on the challenge, if you can meet the challenge, that brings you security for a while, brings you a sense of certainty. And the other way is to avoid things, and I can do some of that too. If it's scary, you avoid it, and then you can feel at least safe temporarily. I think the biggest part is the, is the doubting mind itself. Uh, if you're looking for what can go wrong, you can always find something. I mean, it's just the way it is. So it's helped me you know, switch from doubt to more sense of trust, from mistrusting things to trust. And from that doubt to more faith in myself and other people and all the positives that can happen made a huge difference. So here we hear this six talking about wanting to go from uh, doubt to trust. Yes. And so what is that yeah. journey like for the six? It's, it's everything and it's one of the hardest things to do because if you feel anxiety or you feel threatened, you want to check it out and you look for worst case scenarios. But as you become more comfortable with your own experience, then you can start to hold that steady and be predictable yourself. The very thing that sixes want themselves, predictability. I noticed he used the word scary. Is that a word that sixes yeah. use a lot? Yeah, and the eyes. The thing that you'll notice most of all with the eyes is there's a scanning. They tend to look and, and observe, not unlike the five, but it's faster and more obvious. And that's uh -huh. just tracking things. 
Yeah, I find that six is a, there's a very fine line for them between fear and excitement. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So uh, next, let's take let's talk about Enneagram Type Seven, which we call the entertaining optimist, and the seven is the fascinating, fascinated type. This is the optimistic, and enthusiastic, visionary type on the high side. Um, Kathy, can you give us an example of some key things that might motivate an Enneagram Type 7 to put such a positive spin on things? Well, the 7s are uncomfortable with emotional pain. So they focus on what's positive, upbeat, light, and interesting. They not only want to be interested, they want to be interesting. And they have a fear of disappointment, disappointing you and being disappointed. Most of all, they have a fear of missing out. So they focus on the future, on possibility, on the way things can be. So this type is also in the head center, so they're yeah. dealing with anxiety and fear like the mm -hmm. five and six, but they're mm -hmm. managing that fear by focusing on a positive future. Mm -hmm. What is that? Is that like making plans for good things to happen? Yes, if you're bored or in a negative uh, experience, your mind, still a head type, goes to ideas that are more pleasant, more interesting, more desirable. So you focus on how great it's going to be in the future rather than the doldrums of whatever's going on right now. So some famous examples of type 7 yeah, would be have a lot of uh, them. lots of them. They're mm -hmm. a lot, they fill the entertainment world. Yeah, they do. We have uh, Bono from U2, uh, Brad Pitt, uh, Jay Leno, Robin Williams, uh, Britney Spears. So let's take yeah. a look at a uh, video of an Enneagram type 7. My name is Atta. I live in Fremont. My type is 7. I'm a one-to-one. -one. Fun-loving, um, imaginative, easygoing, congenial, uh, heady. You know, I say the same hello to a janitor than I say to my boss or to somebody above me in a hierarchy. It seems like, uh, you know, it's, it's more of a person-to-person -person rather than a role-to-role. -role. I don't know how else to describe that. I can make light of things or be uh, out of context sometimes and say things that people could just be shocked. And, but for me, yeah, it would just take the boredom out of things. That <laughs> would be the motive. I feel like I can uh, bring that energy, that high bubble, bubbly energy to, to, uh, to topics that I'm interested in and kind of sell that to others and uh, want to share that sort of ener energy with them. I would say progressive thinking or futuristic thinking would be how I'd characteristically describe myself. For me, it's more like a why not? You know, why not go there and why not try that even if it fails? For me, it's very easy to learn new things. So here again, we're talking about future planning and yeah. he uses the term futuristic thinking. Um, why is this such a progressive type or can you give us an example of that? Well, most importantly, this is the person who turns uh, lemons into lemonade. They want to ha put that positive spin so they can enjoy it more, so they can move towards what we said was the more positive uh, viewpoint. So they frame things in their most positive light. And you know, this is another type that, like type 3 in the U.S., we really idealize. You know, yeah. We love the high side of type 7 because mm -hmm. it's fun, it's playful. Um, and what might be the low side of type 7, or where, where are they get in trouble? Yeah, they can see things as positive when they aren't really positive, and they might not tend to things that are really important because they don't want to go into the emotional distress. Their fear of that distress is far greater than it actually ever is, but because they're focused on the positive future, they're reluctant to be in negativity, mm -hmm. and so they avoid it. And sometimes we just need to deal with negativity. And they can be a little scattered. And sometimes we just need to focus. So at their best, they're positive and upbeat. So let's look at the type 8, the challenging protector. The 8 has a fear of being weak and vulnerable. They want to be open, honest, direct, and to the point. I know this type very well. It's my own. So I'm a little bit opinionated about it, but I can say that eights really want to take charge. They want to be master and commander of, of their life, their circumstances, and of course this is true for me. And I struggle with not always being able to self-limit. And how do you experience eights? 
Well, the key thing with AIDS that's so fascinating is that if we do organizational development in business, a lot of people will mistype others as AIDS if they're in a position of leadership right. or if they're yeah. a particularly strong personality. Right. But the key litmus test is that real AIDS are focused on injustice yes. and they're highly protective. So this is the sort of uh, grayback gorilla uh, in, the, in the jungle mentality, but it's the grayback gorilla that wants to protect everybody in their group. Do, do you feel protective as an AIDS? Oh, absolutely. Yes, definitely a take charge kind of person, but I also protect the weak, the vulnerable, the innocent, those who can't protect themselves, the disenfranchised, the underrepresented. They're always going to come on my screen. Justice is what motivates me into action. So who are some famous eights you'd like to well, suggest? Well, uh, some of our most famous eights are Russell Crowe and Pink, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. woman, man. Russell Crowe often plays the role of an eight, too, like in, in Gladiator. He's always focused on being the protector and helping others. Very common. So shall we look at the video of Type 8? My name is Spencer Chernick. I live in Scotts Valley, California. I am an 8. The words I would use to describe myself as a Type 8 would be honest, uh, confident. I think protectiveness shows up in my life with loved ones because if someone were to mess with anyone that I cared about. It's, it's not even like I go through a thought process of how I'm going to handle the situation. It's just a pretty quick reaction. This is not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen kind of thing. As an eight, I think the thing I've had trouble with the most is I tend to be a little overbearing, uh, overpowering, um, uh, imposing what I think or what I want. I don't even realize it a lot of the time. As an aide, I find justice and fairness to be of the utmost importance. Um, if something's not fair, it drives me absolutely crazy. Um, and I, I live by that. As an aide, uh, I would say what motivates me the most is doing things or, you know, having things that uh, accumulate respect. As an aide, I am very comfortable in a, in a role of power and leadership. In fact, I am not comfortable if I'm in a subordinate role, but I've, I've had to learn over time. Yeah, as an aide, I think trust is a, is a big thing. So this happens to be a very special aide to us. This is uh, my stepson and your son. Yes. So what was yes. it like raising an aide? What was he like? Well, it was very easy to be an eight and have an eight as a child because I knew just how to work with him. But what I would say that he mentioned that's so critical is the issue of power. Eights feel comfortable with power. They seek power. But most importantly, they seek power because they don't want to be overpowered. And they learned very, very young uh, that they didn't like bullies and that they were never going to be bullied again. That's why they focus on injustice. That's why they want to make sure they don't have to deal with that. But in this case, he was especially good at articulating the experience of how comfortable he is with himself. He was always that way from the time he was a little boy. So he always possessed this incredible sense of self-confidence? As a little two-year-old. He was telling people what he thought and protecting them and taking charge and being really kind to littler children, even when he was two. Yeah, that's when I uh, first met him, it was amazing to me that he was so friendly with people and and that he had such this incredible sense of himself and self-confidence. And I noticed that with all eights, that yes. they just are sort of blessed with this uh, very solid sense of self. Yeah, very dynamic, very dynamic individuals. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and take a look at Enneagram Type 9, which we call the Peaceful Mediator. Um, this type is often wants to be peaceful, relaxed, comfortable, and natural. So this is the most conflict avoidant type on the Enneagram, whereas types like fours, sixes, and eights are pretty comfortable with conflict and think that you know, good solutions can come out of conflict. The nine really is trying to avoid conflict. So why is the nine trying to avoid conflict? They want harmony. They want consensus. They want people to go along, to get along. They feel happiest when they feel a sense of calm, when everyone is in agreement. They're very uncomfortable when there's dissension or people are at odds with one another. It makes them physically uncomfortable. Hmm. That's interesting. So is this a really high action type or is this a type that's more um, patient, enduring, and persistent? 
patient, enduring, and persistent. They want that comfort, so they tend to wait. And they let things kind of resolve themselves at first and really only step in when they absolutely have to. So some great examples of famous type nines, as we said, would be our current president, uh, President Obama. Uh, there's actually a lot of presidents that have been nines. Yes. Uh, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, and uh, the actress uh, Renee Zwelliger and Queen Elizabeth II are also nines as well. Yes. So let's take a look at a video of an Enneagram type nine. Uh, my name is Ben. I live in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, my Enneagram type is nine and my instinctual subtype is self-preservation. I would say that I'm uh, inclusive. I like everybody to feel welcome and important, uh, and I'm very considerate. My greatest strength, I would say, is my ability to see different points of view and to understand them and not to be stuck in a single mindset. My greatest weakness is uh, lack of motivation uh, at times for especially, well, for things that I am sort of ambivalent on or sort of want to do, sort of don't want to do, it's, it's hard to just, you know, find the motivation or the oomph to just do it sometimes. I can be sort of passive aggressive and he hesitant. I, I see myself as a force of nature in, in particular situations. Once I know what's going on and I know what I have to do, the task is in front of me, it's very easy. I think the difficulty is when it's unclear what I should be doing. Avoiding conflict is definitely a big thing. I, I think I feel it deeper than a lot of people, and um, it, it's difficult for me to, to get over that hurdle or over that hump to confront something which needs to be confronted. What motivates me is people getting along and respecting each other and having friendly, and not just friendly, but like loving relations with each other. Um, harmony and peace, really, I would say. And that, that's one of the things that really struck me when I read about the type nine and what I identified with is this idea of people just getting along with each other and having peace. So what we really didn't say about the nine is how accepting they are and how great they are at listening. They're, they're good listeners and they see all points of view and they're very, very gentle people. And I would say that overall, it's important to know that nines are the glue that hold the rest of us together, that they're always there when we need them. They're available. Whereas the two goes out and seeks us out and offers help, the nine is allowing and accepting. I, I've heard it said that this type is the power of dispassion, whereas the four is the power of passion. Absolutely. For every type on the Enneagram, there's an opposite and types that are lookalikes. And we'll go into that in future shows. Well, great. Well, we would like to take a few minutes here and give you some resources, mm -hmm. uh, if you're enjoying the show, on what you can do to begin your Enneagram journey. Uh, one of the first things that people always want to do, of course, is find out what type they are. They want to find out what type their friends are, uh, their coworkers. There's some great resources that we'd like to give you right now to be able to do that. Um, of course, we would recommend that you start uh, with a test. Uh, we do have a free Enneagram test. It's on our website, which is at Enneagram.net. Any other good resources to start out with on your Enneagram journey that you could recommend? Well, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, we're under Enneagram Explorations, and we have kind of ongoing dialogue with people that are discussing different celebrities or different issues that we work with with the Enneagram. Yeah, so Facebook has actually become a wonderful resource yeah. for us, and yeah. uh, we connect with people literally from all over the globe. Uh, sometimes we put up videos of different people, um, and we just, uh, it was Oscar season, and we had a lot of fun, and we actually posted the types of the different movie stars um, on our Facebook account, um, and we also did it on Twitter. Yes. Uh, yes. Catherine and I enjoy using Twitter, yes. and we send out tweets um, that can be, uh, for example, Charlie Sheen has been in the news a lot, so we sent mm -hmm. out a tweet that he's a type 7. Mm -hmm. um, so Twitter's nice. We'll send out announcements on uh, anything that's upcoming or topical. Um, it's uh, also helpful for people to uh, obviously get Enneagram books. Yes. Uh, back in the old days when Catherine and I started, most people determined their type just from looking at a book. 
Um, also, this is an ongoing series, uh, so we'll be going much deeper into each of the nine Enneagram types, particularly in the next episode. Um, this show today was simply to give you a quick overview of the system, and we're going to go much deeper uh, as we go through, and that will help you to identify your type. Anything else you'd suggest? Yeah, we're going to look at new? the lexicon. We talked about the word choices that are indicative of type, and we're going to show you images and the research when people sent in pictures and phrases that they felt were indicative of their type. And we're going to show these clips again, so don't worry, they'll be back, but we're going to go into many aspects of the Enneagram that differentiate one type one from another type one. That you are your type, but there are variations, and we're going to go into that as well. And one of the things that we often say to people new with the Enneagram is that the Enneagram is primarily about motivation. So it's not just about behavior. So the yes. question we're really asking yes. is a more complicated question, which is not what behavior did someone do, but why did they do it? Mm -hmm. And Catherine and I are both researchers, and we'll yes. be bringing a lot of that research into the show. And next week in particular, we get to see a very juicy piece of research that Catherine did, which are these archetypal images that all that the different types relate to. And it's a fascinating piece of work. Um, so in the last uh, few seconds, is there anything you'd like to leave our viewers with? So the important thing to remember is that a two is a two, no matter where you are, no matter what country you're in, no matter what language is spoken. It's universal, and we need all nine types. Each type brings something really critical and important to every family, group, and organization. So we want to thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time as we continue to take a look at the Enneagram. So, Catherine, I was thinking that, you know, with these different types, that they might be useful in career as well. <laughs>